of the nation's most critical uh, challenges. And to give some background about MITRE, we were established in 1958 as a not-for-profit um, to act in, as a conflict-free environment sp focusing on science and technology. Um, at present, we do this by participating in the, e the ecosystem of federally funded research development centers. Um, so what is exactly an FFRDC or a federally funded research development center? Um, they strive to have values such as objectivity and independence, um, to act in the public interest, to establish long-term relationships with the federal government, um, be a strategic partner in solving some of the nation's most uh, challenging problems. Um, essentially, we serve as channels of expertise to advance the government uh, missions. Some of the currently MITRE operates seven federally funded research development centers. These range from National Security, Cyber, um, National Security Engineering Center to Judiciary to Healthcare. Um, the one that most applies to Sarah and myself is the Cybersecurity FFRDC, um, which is where most of our work currently falls underneath. But MITRE as a whole, um, we there's a wide span of work that we do. Um, as I've mentioned before, um, we have a long history founded in 1958, currently uh, in the present. Um, some of the most notable, some of the notable things that we've accomplished over the years, in the early 1950s, the Whirlwind Computer, which is one of the first digitally electronic computers that was operated in real time, um, might have had a big hand in that project. Um, fast forwarding into like the 1970s, we were part of the traffic alert and collision avoidance system um, to help reduce mid-air collisions in the 1970s. Um, going even further to the 1990s, we created a prototype for IntelliLink, which was a group of secure um, intranets used by the United States um, intelligence community. Um, going ahead another couple of decades um, to about 2011, um, we helped create web-enabled electronic health records, which was a great uh, sharing, which helped share vital patient data uh, securely and easily across the government. Um, and then even 2014, um, you know, cyber threat and, and information sharing, which is pretty applicable to our current talk today with TRAM and the attack framework, um, we play a big part in the cyber threat intelligence community um, today. And you, you can see from this long distinguished history, MITRE works across a wide range of sectors and does a lot of projects. Um, this, to be able to solve all these problems, we need to be critical thinkers um, in science and math, social science, systems engineering. Um, we can't be focused, we can't be experts in one system or one specific technology. We have to have a wide range of expertise across the company to be able to actually solve all these problems that we do currently face. Um, we want to focus on innovation, collaboration, and getting results to help the mission of the federal government. And lastly, um, currently we, this slide I think is a little outdated. I think we're more closer to about 8,000 or even over a little 8,000 employees now, but about 67% of us actually hold uh, advanced degrees, um, about 25 average years of experience, and the average tenure at MITRE is actually 12 years, which is pretty impressive. Um, so with that, that's a nice little introduction to what MITRE does as a whole. Um, one of the projects that stemmed from the Rhino Corporation um, is TRAM, um, the Threat Report Attack Mapper. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to tackle threat reports with TRAM. So who are we? Um, this is why you came today to talk to myself and Sarah. Um, we are we are cybersecurity engineers um, for the MITRE Corporation. I focus a lot on development and working on building systems to help teams. Um, I also do a lot of work involved in security operations. On the more fun side of me, at least, um, I am a cat dad, proud cat dad of my lovely cat, Diane. She's on my banner for my Twitter if you want to go follow me and check her out, at McGee underscore, thank you. Um, I try to collect as many socks as possible. Whenever my friends go to conferences, I always make them bring back socks for me because I just love socks. Today I'm wearing my black comfy socks because I've been on my feet a lot today, so sorry I can't show anything off. Um, and I want to be a marathoner, so I'm close. I did half, half a marathon, so I'm halfway there. We'll see how that turns out, though. Uh, and Sarah? Great, thank you. Um, as Connor mentioned, my name is Sarah Yoder, also a cybersecurity engineer, but I tend to focus more on the cyber threat intelligence side and dabble in a little bit of red teaming. Um, I am not a wannabe marathoner. <laughs> I'd rather suck at three sports and do triathlons. I did about three this last year. Um, had a Disney pass most of my life, and I love a good cup of chai tea. So let's get into things. So before we actually get into TRAM, it's important that we all have a solid understanding of the attack framework, since that's where this project stemmed from. So starting off, I like to reference 
um, David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain, which describes how some indicators that adversaries leave behind are more painful for them to change than other ones. So um, as you can see, hash values um, are easy um, on the defender side to watch for, right? You can make an IOC based on a hash. Well, um, similarly, it's also easy for adversaries to change that, right? All they have to do is change a few bits um, and they'll have a new hash file. And so as we look at this uh, pyramid, moving our way up, um, things get harder for the adversary to change. So, right, we have domain names, which are harder maybe than a hash value, but still pretty easy for an adversary. And then as we move up to you know, the, the top part, we have TTPs, um, which we'll get into our tactics, techniques, and procedures. And these are the adversary's behaviors, right? This is kind of what makes them them. And this is where attack falls in. So what is attack? So it's a knowledge base of adversary behaviors. I kind of like to think of it almost as a um, encyclopedia, right, of known behaviors. You can go to it and get a ton of information there. So it's based on real world observations. Everything in the in attack it can be linked back to its original source. Um, and this is, I think, for a few reasons, right? One is so that you don't have to just take our word for it. We hope that you can go and validate what we have there. Um, and second, it proves of what we've actually seen adversaries do. We aren't trying to discuss you know, what hypothetically could be possible. We're only showing what has actually been seen. Next attack is free, open, and globally accessible. Anybody can access it, attack.minor.org. And lastly, it's community driven. So um, we, uh, as most of the attack team, we don't always have insight right, into um, data that's out in the real world. And so we rely on people using the framework to let us know what they're seeing, maybe where attack has gaps that we can help uh, fill, things like that. And so if anybody here is interested in contributing, please reach out to us at attack at Meyer.org. So, um, if you've been to the attack website, you've seen this giant matrix. Um, so kind of breaking it down across the top, kind of in blue there, we have our tactics, right? And these are the adversary's goals. So their goal probably, right, first step is initial access. A goal after that might be lateral movement or credential access and so on. Within each goal, we have techniques. And this is how that goal is actually achieved. So if the goal is initial access, how they might do that would be spear phishing. We can drill down a little bit further and get to the procedure level. And this is a specific way that an adversary has done the technique. So as you can see here, we have, um, right, the goal would have been initial access. They did that through spear phishing attachment. And um, the procedures would say, hey, APT 12 has done it this way. APT 3 has done it maybe a different way, but within that same technique. So if you go into um, each technique, we have a description of what it is. And I find this really helpful because I don't know what all of the techniques were, and I still don't. Um, this is also something I'll point out that um, the language in here used to describe these techniques will uh, become important later on as we start talking about TRAMP. So just kind of keep that in mind. Along with each technique, um, we have some other information too, right? We have what platform it applies to. We have some data sources of where you might go to find that technique. And I'll note here that um, data sources are pretty broad and that's on purpose because depending on what type of tooling or configuration is in your environment, um, these data sources are gonna look different. Uh, and next we have mitigations of ways that you might be able to you know, mitigate a certain technique to prevent the adversary from being able to do this. Again, kind of broad, but at least it's a starting place. And um, then we have detection. So places kind of to follow up from data sources, this is like maybe how you would actually detect the behavior there. As we saw in the matrix view, uh, each technique then we have yeah, the procedure examples and we have references. Again, going back that everything is open source and you can check out the sources for yourself. So similarly, we have um, pages on groups and software. Um, and so for each group page, again, you'll get a short description, just kind of some background on what that group is, as well as associated group descriptions. So 
Um, MITRE, we do not try to, we do not attribute uh, anything. We can only take what others have told us, but there does seem to be a lot of overlap in certain groups, and so we group them together for that reason. Um, but we do want to note that because these groups are, um, are described by different people, you know, um, those people have different data sets that they're getting from. Um, again, on each group page, then you can see a list of techniques that they have used, as well as what software they've used, and back to references. So I think Connor's gonna share how we actually get all this data into attack. Yep. yep, so it's very easy to go to the attack website, click on the technique, and start reading about it. Same idea applies for your softwares and groups. It's very easy to see the list, find something you might be interested in, and learn about it. Um, however, understanding the entire process and the, back, uh, the backbone to the attack framework and the internal process that we have um, is very manual. It's time consuming and challenging. It starts with a backlog of reports. Um, do we have this ever-growing backlog of reports that we know we need to analyze that are important and can contribute to the attack framework in some way? Um, this report is growing every single day and um, continually, uh, continues to become a challenge for us to keep up to date with. Um, but with that report, an analyst will be assigned to it and start reading through it. This analyst will start going through the report, identify interesting information or key tidbits that they care about, um, and note it that as something that might want to be inserted into the attack uh, framework. They do this all manually. It's you know as simple as actually if you had a, a website and you're re reading a blog post and then pick, picking out key information that you cared about. Uh, once an analyst is done reviewing a report, there is a more uh, defined review process on, as part of the attack team. Um, and handles you know, our manual input process into our tooling, which uh, goes into our whole pipeline of going from um, our internal tool to the public website. Um, so you can see all these steps are pretty manual in terms of setting up the backlog, back, backlog of reports, reading through all of them, identifying the key information that we care about, and then finally getting that published to the attack website. Um, reiterating those points. We find open source reporting, as Sarah mentioned before, all the attack reports are publicly available. Um, so it's pulling in all those reports as fast as possible, and then finding those behaviors that in the report that we care about. Um, so let's talk about one of those examples. Uh, this slide already has um, identified actions within a report and tactics, but I'm gonna talk through the entire process. Imagine this is a paragraph taken from a threat intelligence report that we know we care about. Um, we know it has some attack techniques in it that we want to extract and put into the hack framework as references. So what I'll do as an analyst is I'll start reading this paragraph and ident identify actions or verbs essentially that are happening. So in this first example, you know, obfuscates its executable code prior to compilation. Obfuscated code sounds like some type of action that is happening, whether it's done by um, an adversary or a piece of malware, in this case it's a Trojan a virus, uh, fantastic. That's some type of activity happening that I know I'll care about. So I'll mark that down and I'll come back to it later. This process of an analyst reviewing goes through a couple iterations. I'll continue going through the report and find other stuff, you know, um, obscures the links to the necessary API function, reviews the directory, encrypting files on a victim. Um, these are all actions that are happening, whether done by uh, code or an, an or an adversary. And I'm gonna mark these down and as an analyst to review. So once I've gone through the report initially, I'll start going through tactics. Tactics help me bucket these techniques that might actually apply to these actions that have been taken. Um, so it makes it easier after I go through the final review process as an individual analyst. So obfuscates to executable code applies to defense evasion. Um, reviews the, direct, uh, the directory as part of discovery. And I'll bucket these within the appropriate tactics as far as I can tell. Um, after I've gone through the whole report again, I'll then go through and add the individual techniques from attack that I think apply from that tactic. So defense evasion, obfuscated files or information applies to the first action for obfuscating executable code. Um, reviews the directory, file and directory discovery as part of the discovery tactic. Um, going through this iteration process of finding um, actions taken by an adversary or, or a piece of code, bucking that into a tactic and identifying the technique within that tactic that I care about is usually the process that most analysts go through for identifying attack techniques throughout a report. Um, but there's a lot of challenges with this. Um, first, it's hard to remember everything. There is a lot of attack techniques that exist. There's about, um, there's over 250 techniques, and you're not, as an analyst, you're not gonna remember every single one of them as you read the report. 
Sure, there's plenty of techniques that have come up more often than others, but there's always you always have to keep in the back of your mind, when am I going to see an obscure technique used by an adversary that is not very often seen? So this is a challenge. Uh, some other challenges is that it's a time-consuming process. As I mentioned before, this backlog of reports is constantly growing. Every single day, new reports are coming out that are being added to this list that we know we need to analyze and get into attack. However, it's, it's challenging. We don't have enough, there's not enough team members to go through this every day, and it's a manual review process, so it's the actual time taken to read a report, analyze it, get into attack. But meanwhile, the next day, there's 10 new reports out anyway that I have to get through. Uh, human error. We're all going to make mistakes at the end of the day, you know, whether it's identifying the wrong technique or missing a technique in a report. It's going to happen. Um, humans make mistakes. It's perfectly fine. But accounting for that will add to your th the length of time it takes. Uh, lastly, training new team members. Um, with any team, there's going to be new people you bring on. As, as projects grow and expand, you want to bring on more people to help carry this load. Um, but it's a very large learning curve bringing in new team members just because the large number of information, the large amount of information within the attack framework can be very daunting and intimidating. Um, so the, the time it takes for them to get up to speed and be able to correctly and successfully identify attack techniques or groups or software within a report takes a lot of time. Um, so this is such a time consuming process. So um, what did we do? So yes, so as Connor mentioned, this created a problem. And so about a year ago, uh, myself and uh, one of the other members that was really kind of in the weeds on the reports figured, OK, we can't live like this, right? We need a better way. And so it started um, with, I was like, OK, maybe we can do some string searches, right? At least on some of the easy techniques, like spear phishing, credential dumping, looking for Mimi cats. Those were all pretty easy. Um, but we were still missing then a ton of techniques doing it that way and writing a regex for, you know, exfil over alternative protocol, like, was not easy to do. And so that's when um, other people started mentioning, hey, you should look at NLP or natural language processing. Um, and so we did. So um, I am not an NLP expert by any means, but this is kind of the methodology that we followed when making the tool. So first, we have to get the data. And so to do this, we use the, uh, the procedures, right? Because these are known good examples um, used from open source reporting to describe a certain technique. Next, we have to then um, get the data into a clean state for it to be processed. So um, this means that we have to turn our text into kind of like the simplest version um, that a computer can read. So this includes things like removing punctuation, removing words like the, and, et cetera, um, and uh, trimming off um, kind of the ends of some words. So instead of masquerade, masquerading, masqueraded, we can um, do something called stemming to get that just to like the important part of the word we care about. Um, and then we have to tokenize the data. And this just means splitting up the text into smaller units, generally words um, that we call tokens. I know I'm not on there. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> um, that then that way we can then like count the number of words within a certain um, sentence, or we can then more easily see, um, you know, if the same word is appearing a lot of times in relation to a certain technique. So now that we have the data and we've kind of done some pre-processing and cleaned it, we can then train our models. So um, for each model, we use an uh, open source Python library to do this. And we use a method called logistic regression, um, which is good for making predictions. And that's kind of what we decided would be the best way to approach this, because when we read a new report, and me as an analyst that's kind of reading through that, I'm predicting that a certain sentence you know, has credential dumping in it, right? Um, and so this model is pretty good at that. And so um, additionally, um, our method is a supervised learning. Um, and this is just uh, a common phrase within NLP. And that just means that we kind of know what our output should be, i.e. like a specific technique. So um, from there, we then need to um, test the data on reports that we know will have attack techniques in them. So essentially, you kind of, right, we've built the model, and before we go test it on 
new reports that we haven't looked at before, we kind of give the computer a leg up and say, okay, we know that all these reports are going to have techniques in them, so like, how does the model do? And from there, you can kind of set some different values to say, okay, I need to make sure that my models are hitting a certain threshold in order for it to be good, right? Or like a useful model. So once we've done that, um, we then um, can actually kind of test the data and, or rather test our models like on new uh, data with uh, sentence extraction, right? So now at this point is kind of where TRAM is uh, fully functioning to the point that it can look at a new report, pull out all the sentences, apply its prediction to those sentences, um, and let you know what it found. From there, we then um, have to review the model's decisions. So we say, yes, this one was good, this one was bad, right? And then that kind of creates the feedback loop of being able to then improve the models in the future. So. Connor's going to do a demo. Yeah. Are we doing a live demo? I don't have a video. Um, I had some updates last night, so we're going to do it live. OK, so uh, Tram, where'd you go? Oh, is it because I'm in presenter mode? Bear with me. Cool, so this is Tram. Um, Tram, Tram currently is a local run program that runs on any of your current systems. Um, it's not designed uh, necessarily to be on like an internet uh, or a public website or an internal your internal network. Um, it can be, however, it's just a local application that you have reports that you want to run. Um, we have future plans that we'll get to that will address that. Um, however, this is when you turn on Tram. This is what it looks like, and there's a few different screens that I'm gonna, a few different panels that I'm going to talk through. On the left, we can see uh, enter a new report. So currently, we have two main methods to insert reports into TRAM. Um, the first is you can enter in the actual URL that you care about, um, along with the title that you want to name it. This can also be a comma-separated list within this input box that you want to do. Um, or if you have a much longer list and you don't want to type things out, you can enter a CSV of URLs and their appropriate titles um, that will automatically feed into TRAM and queue those all up. Um, in the bottom left, you can see we have a queue, and that will keep track of the ones that have not been run yet, but are part of the queue that will get run eventually, um, which I will demonstrate in a few minutes. Um, in the main section, we have three columns. We have needs review, analyst reviewing, and complete. Um, and this idea kind of stemmed from our internal attack uh, workflow. We, you know, we have this backlog of reports that we need to do, so we'll send them through TRAM, and they need to be reviewed by an analyst. So an analyst will pick them up, um, and assign it to themselves, and they'll, you know, they'll be assigned this report, and they'll be reviewing it. Oh. And um, so now they're reviewing it, and now they go through the report, and they analyze it. We'll go into a report in a few minutes, but uh, and they complete it, and that's our workflow. Um, that's, the, that's the goal behind these, these three uh, columns. And so that's the initial layout. And so I've already gone here and added one report by default. But what I'm going to actually do is upload a CSV of three reports so you can see how the queue actually works. Uh, so as you can see, you know, choose a file. I'm going to go to my desktop and tram talk CSV. And it's literally just, you know, you have the two columns of URL and title. And then I have the down below as a, in a CSV format of three URLs and their titles. Super straightforward. And when I click upload, um, tram will start in the background and start analyzing, uh, inputting them. Um, wait for it to pop up here. This is PyCharm for those who don't know. PyCharm is fantastic for Python development. I don't, I'm not getting paid for this, but anyway, um, you can see the first one is getting inserted. Um, there's a link for uh, Fin7, inf infamous cybercrime rig, and then um, the models are loaded against our, uh, it's called a pickle file, and now Tram is now analyzing this URL that we entered um, for it to find attack techniques. And if we go back to Tram, we can see that the three reports as part of the CSV file have been added to the queue. So when these, so currently fin 7.5 continues, um, is currently being run, and once that's finished, it will be updated to the needs review section, and then as an analyst can assign themselves and review it. So while that's running in the background, we're gonna dive into Silver Terrier. So when you click on a report, um, the title of, of the report is, uh, is there for you. This is user defined. This is um, whatever you want to call it, you know, the URL section and the title section. What you put in the title section will appear here. 
Below it, we have two export features currently into a PDF and a, a JSON uh, navigator layer, which I will also talk about when we get to the exports, but first we're gonna walk through a actual review of, of a report. So as we scroll down, you can see there's this picture. Uh, this is actually part of the Silver Terrier initial report. And now that I mentioned it, I forgot one thing. Um, so source versus analyze. Source is the original URL that we're now analyzing, just to make sure that's clear. So I were to click on it, you can see that's the image part of the actual report. And this is the original if you do want to skim through it. So for us, if we want to analyze it, we pull in the images because we're trying to replicate the reports to some extent to try to give them some formatting. So you'll see in this example, there are a couple charts that are included that the original report also includes, so that's good for context. Um, we do some other basic formatting like lists and stuff, but nothing too, uh, nothing too crazy. Um, so like you would normally read a report, you'd skim through, or actually read it, not skim through, and, and, you'd, and you'd go about your day and you try to identify stuff, and you can see some of the charts that um, we pulled in from the original report. Um, and then eventually, or hopefully, you will find uh, some highlighted sentences. So a highlighted sentence indicates that a uh, attack technique was found within the sentence. So if I now click onto it, um, you can see on the right side that there is some techniques found. Um, and you can ignore that these are confirmed already. I was playing with it before because I was testing. Um, and as Sarah mentioned with the train the model, we have accept and reject. So when we accept a technique as part of a sentence, that gets parted into our true positive table, and now our, our, our code will understand that, okay, this sentence is a true positive for the permission group's discovery technique, and now we'll take that into account next time we you know, rerun this report or we found another technique that might be permission group's discovery, and uh, we can learn off that. I'm not gonna accept it again because I've already added it a few times here. Um, the same idea applies for reject. I'm gonna reject some other uh, sentences though later. Um, and there's two of them here because I was also double testing the add a missing technique. Um, we'll go to a completely new sentence for that though. So say I'm scrolling and I find, um, let's go towards this one, right? Oh, they're all permission group discovery. Gotta love live demos. Perfect, right? We have this other sentence that has a technique for remote uh, file copy, and let's say I reject this one. Um, and I reject it, it removes the highlighting of the sentence, and now it's no longer actually relevant. If I were to now uh, click back into it, and I say, oh wait, this, this sentence actually does contain a tax technique that I want to add to it, I can now go in and add that technique. Admin, add technique, and now it's a confirmed technique. Um, and it will re-highlight the uh, sentence, and you can see it's there. Um, so, so just for the exports, I'm going to add a couple of techniques. Boom, and we'll do like this one too for, I don't know, compile after delivery. That sounds fun. All right, so now we've gone through this report. Um, we've accepted and rejected. We found techniques. We've added techniques that TRAM actually missed itself, and we've confirmed them. Um, this all goes into our, our local database that's running as part of TRAM, and the model will uh, learn against this and update. So now this goes to the exports. For export PDF, if I click on export PDF, it will do exactly that, and down below, this will pop up. And all this is is a uh, downloadable PDF version of the, of the report, um, obviously, and the exciting part is at the end, where you, there's a table outlining the techniques found and the identified sentences associated with that. And the idea behind this PDF is that it's easily shareable compared to a local run application. So if you have a, a report that you've run through TRAM that you want to share with somebody, you can be like, here's this report that I have for you. And then the second part is the export uh, navigator layer JSON. So if I click download, um, it downloads a JSON file, but I really want to run this tool. And what this is, um, it's a interactive version of the attack matrix. What this allows me to do is add highlighting and, and um, some you know, colorful, colorful outlines on top of techniques to make it more um, easily digestible. And like you have your focus, you have your focuses of like, what you care about. For example, if I care about the techniques used by APT29, I can highlight specifically those used by APT29 within this tool. Um, that is. Where is the, I'm not getting the example, that's not part of this. Um, so if I want to attach that layer now that we've created from TRAM, we just do open existing layer, upload from local, uh, downloads, and Silvateria 1 JSON. And you can see that some of them are now blue and underlined. Um, these are the confirmed techniques from the TRAM report that we've now confirmed. And this helps us 
identify if we have, if we run a threat report and we know we want to care about um, X, you know compile after delivery permission groups discovery, um, we can now easily visualize that. And within this actual uh, cell, we can see the specific sentence that this technique was found on. So you can reference that back. Um, so those are the two export versions. And so that's um, a tram report after it's been run. So let's see, yep, fantastic. So FIN 7.5 continues, uh, finished being analyzed. While we were doing that, you can still see that these two reports are still part of the queue. Those will get run eventually. Um, just to show, okay, great. This report now has some examples. Uh, spear phishing link, let's accept that one. Why not? Uh, so on and so forth. And you can go through this, accept, reject. Um, that's the current workflow that we have for TRAM. Um, we're not going to wait for the other one to finish, obviously, um, but that covers it for the for the demo. Amazing. All right, let me put this back on the slides. Thank you for those subtle claps. Cool. We're past this. Demo. So why does this matter? That's a fun little tool. Now you can run a bunch of reports in. You get a bunch of attack techniques from them. Um, but why does this ultimately matter to you? Um, well, it helps individuals and organizations get started with attack. Attack can be a very daunting, um, I'll call it a program just for simplicity, um, but it really is just the knowledge base of information, and that knowledge base can be intimidating. Um, there's a lot of information within attack, and understanding it is difficult. So by utilizing TRAM, you can run a report that you think is interesting and identify those attack techniques. And that narrows down the focus of what you actually kind of care about or interested in. Um, it's a subtle and easy way to get introduced to the attack framework. Um, going back to an actual analyst and doing their job, um, it helps find techniques that we might forget about. So if TRAM runs through a report, um, for example, compile after, the, after delivery, um, maybe I completely forgot about that actual technique, but that TRAM found it in the report, and now I can mark that down as something we want to include as part of our uh, uh, the attack frameworks, you know, our methodology internally to get it public. Uh, finally, it's using reporting that is important to you. So going back to the Navigator uh, JSON file and how it presents in the highlights, it's hard to stay up to date um, with cybersecurity threat reports. There's a lot that comes out every single day, and attack team certainly does not update every single day. We update roughly every quarter, and we will. there's no way if you look solely for the um, at the attack matrix, you're not going to find all the interesting URLs and articles that you care about. So by using, like, utilizing TRAM, you can run a report that, come out, that came out that day, find techniques within that report, um, and then make sure those map to your, your threat model and what you care about. Sarah. Cool. So um, challenges we faced with this project um, and or are still facing, really. So the first one was a limited data set. So given the models that we used in order, um, so, OK, for the models, we built one model per technique. Um, however, there had to be at least 10 procedure examples in order to, for a model to be built. And this uh, created a challenge because some techniques might only have three procedure examples. Some even have none or one. And so we weren't able to make a model for those techniques. And even then, 10 isn't really a great number when it comes to kind of like data science, right? Um, and so hopefully in the future as we have more data, um, that will become easier. May, you never know, right? Um, next, like it's hard to extract you know meaning from text. So um, this is something that even you know humans can kind of struggle with. We can interpret words differently. If I read a report and then Connor reads it, we're probably going to come up with two different answers. And so then it's another challenge to then tell a computer which of us is right. Um, and next, several techniques are very similar. So um, a differentiation between spear phishing attachment and link is pretty hard to distinguish, especially for like a computer model, since so many of the words um, overlap. Or often, we've seen adversaries right, that send a link that then uh, maybe opens an attachment. right? And so if you're having all these overlapping words, it's kind of hard to uh, make a model that knows the difference there. Um, so where does that kind of leave us, and how are we going to overcome these challenges? Um, so our first and like biggest uh, change that will be coming to TRAM soon is model improvements. So 
Um, we've looked at a variety of different NLP uh, methods and ways to do this. And so um, we are working now with like an NLP expert to help us improve our system and workflow there. Um, and so stay tuned because some cool stuff uh, should be coming out soon. Um, next is our kind of like the input and output streams, right? So um, this was built with the attack team's uh, workflow in mind, right? Because that was easy. I was solving a problem that I was facing. But many companies have right, a, a huge uh, backlog of reports, and they want to just feed it through something like TRAM and then output that into maybe like their cyber threat intelligence you know, tool or platform. And so um, the TRAM currently is built on a REST API, and so we're going to make sure to keep it flexible and extensible so that those connections can be easily made. And then lastly, multi-user support. So as Connor mentioned in the beginning, TRAM right now really is mainly focused at one user at a time on your local system. But we get that that's not scalable, right? Most people would want a team to be able to access this. Um, and so before we say that it supports that, we want to add some features like the ability to you know, comment that, hey, Connor, I think you were wrong on this technique, right? Before it goes into like the final version. Not that you are ever wrong, but <laughs> um, things like that, as well as, um, yeah, just and have like user control, things like that, right? Um, so that's kind of like our you know, future steps. Um, but with that, um, that's it. <laughs> uh, you can check out TRAM right now. We do say that it's in more of a beta stage, right, until we get a lot of these features flushed out more and have things working more smoothly. But we would encourage everybody to check it out and give us feedback. If you want to send in a pull request, we wouldn't complain yeah. on that either. Yeah, feel free to issue pull requests, you know. <laughs> yep. So with that, um, we have lots of time for questions or networking. Um, and the one last thing I'm supposed to say is that we have a table full of our open job um, recs. So if you are interested in doing this type of work, please check those out. But thank you. Thank you. Any questions right off the bat? Uh, and if you do have questions, please use a microphone. Yeah. Yeah, microphones, people online. Yeah, please don't be intimidated by the microphone. Is it working? Is it on? Hello. It is working. Cool. Um, so who are the primary users of attack and uh, both consuming the data and inputting data and kind of why? Mm -hmm. I can do it. Yep. Yeah. So. Okay, so who's using attack was the first question, right? So, I mean, I don't want to sound cliche, but everybody, uh, but with a caveat though, right? Um, so uh, we have four main use cases of attack. So we have adversary emulation, so people using the information to then influence their red team operations. Um, we see defenders using it. I think that's probably the most common use case where you know people in a SOC can use the tool like Connor showed with Navigator, right? And start mapping out where their defenses are in order to start showing where their gaps are in those defenses. Um, cyber threat intelligence. So being able to organize your data, right? Um, Attack does that already, right? You can go to maybe the APT3 page, right? And see all that data. However, if you're in the private sector and you're tracking groups separately, Attack is a good way then to at least apply the behaviors to, you know, kind of an unknown group, as an example. And lastly, security engineering. security engineering. That's a good one. Oh yeah, which kind of falls, I think, under like the SOC assessment type uh, idea. So yeah, we have lots of information on the website that get much more in in depth than each of those areas. And then there was a second question to that. So sorry. Yeah, I was asking about like uh, in, uh, input. Who's inputting data into the attack system? Oh, right. So contributors. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, everyone, but with the <laughs> the caveat that um, you know it is a, a open source framework, right? So anybody can contribute. We see people from private and public sector, right, 
sending us, um, generally I would say that they tend to send us like a link to maybe a blog that's not in attack already. And we have actually a structured process on how you can contribute. Um, if you, you know, are really interested in a certain type of malware that's not in attack and you have some reports already kind of mapped for us, then you could send those over and be like, hey, can you add this? And we'll, we'll review it and, and, you know, communicate with you on that. But, yeah. Yep. One more. Any uh, any idea on like the number of reports you guys get? Just Ooh. millions. Millions. Okay. <laughs> billions. Um, I do not have a number off the top of my head, but um, we get a lot. Okay. Around five hundred currently. Cool. So Thank a lot. You. <laughs> Oh, I think we have one in the back. Oh, yeah. Feel free to just yeah walk up to the microphones. Yeah, we'll also be around for a little bit afterwards if you want to come talk. I was, I'm, I'm Ray Majidi. Thank you for the sh uh, speech and show. Uh, here's my question. Maybe it's different angle. Let's say you got a customer with about 500 user. Uh, they, they hire you guys. They say come in, and then check out our security measure. What steps would you guys take? Is that? Can you repeat so, the question? Can we? What recommendations would you have? What would, would you categorize this as the question? Like, if, um, so a small organization they, and you're trying to build up a security user, team. There are 500 users, mm -hmm. and they ask Matter to come in, please. You know, mm -hmm. they hire you guys, and then do a measure take. I mean, like a, take a measure to see where the holes are, and yeah. Uh, so I, probably the first thing uh, would be understand, like making sure you understand your assets and figuring out what actually might be of a target by an actual adversary. That is what I would recommend and start with. Um, attack is as Sarah, one of the use cases Sarah mentioned with cyber threat intelligence, right? And so one of the key things with cyber threat intelligence is understanding why an adversary might be targeting you, and that's understanding your assets and why those are valuable. So a financial industry is going to be more concerned with techniques used by an adversary like Fin7 versus um, government organizations which care more about you know, nation state actors. So it's figuring out why you might be attacked by an adversary, and, and that's understanding your assets. Um, so regardless of like standing up like, a, like your SOC team or buying new firewalls or whatever the case is, part of it is understanding your, what, you what, why, what your organization has and why it's important. That, is that, that make sense? Cool. Hey, for your adversary you're talking about, yes. are they trying to go in the network system or the computer system, or does it vary? So do you mean, like I mentioned, like Fin7, like what are they trying to do? Yeah, if they're trying to go in the network through the router, trying to go in the malware. Yeah, so each adversary, adversaries have different goals and it depends on where they are. You know, if you look at the attack tactics, they it's like almost like the attacker life cycle, right? So getting initial access, what does that look like, whether it's a sphere fish or some other means? Um, and then going through that life cycle of, okay, I'm on a network, do I want to laterally move or do I want to exfiltrate information off this current system that I'm currently on? So um, it definitely varies a lot. I'd look at it more in sense of um, that attacker life cycle going across the uh, the attack tactics. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. Yeah. I see it. Does that make sense a lot? <laughs> yeah. So, my question is based on, on your journey. Like, how did you start uh, personally, you and both of you guys? Like, how did you start with Mitre? Uh, where did you guys uh, kind of got your journey started in the attack field? Mm -hmm. And I can go first. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been doing cybersecurity things since I was like in like high school, I'd say. I don't know. It's like I had a computer growing up and it was a lot of fun. And then I got into like the security side of things and I wanted to get better at it. And then, you know, you start hearing more news about um, <clears throat> like, you know, cyber crimes and nation state actors. And it's like, oh, that's super interesting. And I was in a position where I had an offer from MITRE, and I was like, oh, well, I know the attack framework already. I've heard it before. I've never, I, in my limited experience, 
Um, I've, never, I've never used an actual application, um, but I know about it and I appreciate it. And now I have this opportunity where I can come to the organization that houses it. Um, and that was something I wanted to pursue. And here I am now speaking about attack and it's fantastic. So just a, an interest in this greater uh, scheme of uh, cyber conflict and just wanting to get more involved with that. And then for myself, um, in college, I actually studied business cybersecurity. Um, so cyber was more of a small part, right? I don't have a computer science background or anything. But then after college, I worked for the government where I learned a lot more technical skills. And it was through that job that one day I was kind of bored at work. Not that you ever get bored at work, but kind of looking around the internet and I came across this thing called attack. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. And they had some examples. And so, um, I was able to apply that to some work I was doing at the time, and MITRE then kind of sparked my interest. I, a former alumni from my school uh, works at MITRE, so I reached out to her. I was like, hey, can you tell me more about this MITRE place? Do you like working there? Uh, she was like, yep, it's awesome. I said, cool. Um, and so uh, here I am today working on the attack team. So. So I think that's uh, all the questions, like Connor mentioned, though, we will be kind of just hanging around if you want to catch us after or if you want an attack sticker. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.